Welcome back to our study of Christian beliefs, 20 basics that every Christian should know. Now we're going to go into chapter 8 and answer the question, what is sin? What is sin? Grudem tells us that sin disrupted everything. We don't live the lives we were originally designed to live, and we don't live in a world that we were originally designed to live in, all because of sin. The story of the human race, as presented in the Bible, is the story of God fixing broken people living in a broken world. God is fixing broken people who live in a broken world. Amen. It is the story of God's victory over many results of sin in the world. All that is happening that's breaking the world will ultimately come under the final authority and fixing of Almighty God. Amen. So what is sin? Sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. It's anything that breaks the will and the nature that God has established in action, attitude, or nature. Sin is found in our nature, the internal character that is the essence of who we are. That's Ephesians 2.3. You and I, uh, uh, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. It's in our nature. Now God, by contrast, he's eternally good. Therefore, anything contrary to his moral law is contrary to his character, and it is sin. God hates sin. Let's just be clear. That's strong language, but most people need to hear it. God hates sin because it directly contradicts everything that he is. Do you know where sin came from? We should never blame God for sin or think that God bears the responsibility for sin. That's Deuteronomy 32.4 and James 1.13. No, Ephesians 1.11 makes it clear that uh, God is not responsible for sin. God somehow ordained that sin would come into the world, but he is not responsible for the sin that is committed. It's like, as I explain to people oftentimes, if I make a sharp edged steel object, I did not create the sin that is often done with a knife that is used to stab people. If I make a sharp edged steel object and a person uses it to stab and hurt somebody, they are responsible for the sin. For that same object could instead be used to do open heart surgery and save a life. You see, it's not the responsibility of the maker. It is the responsibility of the sinner who does then take on those choices and chooses to sin. I hope that helps you. Grudem says, God decided that he would allow moral creatures to willfully and voluntarily choose to sin. How we put these two truths together is one of the most difficult questions in theology. It is healthy for us to allow a substantial element of mystery here, admitting that a full understanding is beyond anyone's ability in this age. We should guard against arguments over this. Know this, that a God who wants to give you the gift of love must by action give you the option not to love. For if you are forced to love, it could not then truly be love. You would be robotic. You must have an element of choice in love. And the reality is where and when fallen human beings have an option to love or not love, the majority of the time, the majority of the people will choose what is selfish and not loving. This is at the core the principal nature of our understanding of sin and how it is the sinner's responsibility and not God's. Let's go on. Adam's sin caused us to inherit a sinful nature, naturally opposed now to God and his moral law. We see this in Romans 7, 18, Jeremiah 17, 9, Psalm 51, 5, and Psalm 58, verse 3. Every part of our being, you got to understand this, every part of our being has been affected by sin. We receive not only Adam's sinful nature, but also his sin-produced guilt. 
We are born guilty sinners. It's in our DNA. Although this may seem unfair, remember that it's by one man's obedience that many will be made righteous, Romans 5.19. If you didn't accept the fact that we're all sinful by nature per our first father, Adam, then you couldn't accept the righteousness that comes to us through the one Savior, Jesus the Christ. So again, notice God is good all the time and sin belongs to the sinners and we are responsible for it. Please see the goodness and the grace of God, not in the fact that we are born natural sinners, but that we have a supernatural option presented to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, where he was able to pay the price for every Christian sin past, present, and future. This, my friends, is something that goes far beyond anything that you and I could ever imagine. And trust me, this is so much better for us than simple fair fairness. Because if God were fair, we would all be crucified. We'd be torturous and we'd be tortured and put into eternal damnation for our sin, which we would all commit. We do. Think about it. You don't have to teach a baby how to cry in a selfish way for what they want. It's in us. Praise God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are all guilty of sin and in need of a way to make ourselves right with God. The good news is that God has designed the world in such a way that our individual failings can be redeemed through the work of another. Again, this is the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross. Our individual disobedience can be made right by the obedience of another. Let's take a look at how sin affects us. Knowing now the potential of the good news, let's look at how sin affects us. Grudem says, scripture is clear. There is no one who does not sin. 1 Kings 8.46, Psalm 14.3, Romans 3.23, and 1 John 1.8. Uh, we all stand guilty before God. Again, we are all sinners. That's why we sin. So when we sin as forgiven Christians, what then? Our legal standing before God, praise God, is not affected. It doesn't mean that you won't quench the spirit of God. It's not that you won't be met with discipline, even a partial wrath of God, if your sin is so worthy. But know this, if you are a Christian, even if you are disciplined or you are dealt with a portion of God's wrath, you will never lose your standing before God. He never brings any of the children he's adopted back to the orphanage. He tells us, Jesus himself says that those that are held in his hand are held with the power of the Father and no one and nothing can take anyone that is in his hands out. You can't even jump out on your own decision. No, you are held in his power and nothing can take that away. Nothing will change that. If someone continues in a pattern of disobedience without repentance, so let's now talk about the quote unquote Christian who is not now stumbling, but it's revealed that that's actually their way. They want sin, they live in sin. The trajectory of their life is sin, the ultimate pattern of their life, the priorities of their lives. They all point to sin and sinfulness. Well, Grudem says if someone continues in a pattern of disobedience without repentance, he may not have ever truly put his trust in Jesus for salvation. The point there is that if somebody chooses sin predominantly, then their predominance reveals the root. Jesus said that you would know his people by their love for him and one another. Uh, John 14, 15, if you love me, says Jesus, you will obey my commands. He said, you will know my followers by their love for one another. And we're also told in John 3, 36, that if you believe in the Lord, you will have life. But if you do not obey him, you do not have life. Instead, the wrath of God abides on such a person. You see, the disobedience as a predominance reveals that their fruit was never real fruit. It was plastic fruit. No matter how much they looked like, act like, talked like, no matter how much time they spent in the church, if they were not in Christ, that's the power of sin and it leads to damnation. 
For those that get rattled by this, you need only look as far as Judas. He was with Jesus and the other disciples three years. You couldn't get any closer to Jesus than he was. You couldn't get a, into a bigger part of the church in its powerful expression. He was the trusted treasurer. Everybody but Jesus thought he was the most polished of all. But Jesus told us all the way back in John 6, he knew. He said, one of you is a devil. Friend, please know this. The power of sin is overwhelming. And the only thing that can overwhelm the overwhelming power of sin is the Savior, Jesus the Christ, and his gospel, his good news. I pray that this focus on sin has helped to illuminate your understanding of both sin and our Savior. Amen and amen.